In this video lecture, we're going to be looking at the integration technique of trig substitution. So trig substitution is going to be a useful technique for evaluating integrals that involve forms like a squared minus x squared, a squared plus x squared, or x squared minus a squared, where a is a constant, and usually these forms are under a root. They don't have to be, but trig substitution is particularly useful when we have those kinds of forms underneath some kind of root. So what do we mean by we, uh, when we say things of the form a squared minus x squared, for example? So the following kinds of things we'd consider to be of that form. If you had something like 1 minus x squared or 3 minus x squared, you could also have things like 9 minus 4x squared. So when I have this a squared minus x squared in quotes here, I'm thinking like a number thing squared minus some sort of variable thing squared. It doesn't have to be x specifically. Here this is like 3 squared minus 2x squared. I could also have things like 4 minus x plus 1 squared or 3 minus 2x plus 5 squared. So all of those different things we'd consider to have this form of a squared minus x squared. Number thing squared minus variable thing squared. So what about a squared plus x squared? Well this could be things like 1 plus x squared for a basic example or 4 plus 9x squared. I could also have things like um, 9 plus x squared, 5 plus x plus 1 squared. Again, I'm thinking I have some sort of number thing squared. If I have 5 plus x plus 1 squared, that's like root 5 squared plus x plus 1 squared. Okay. I could also have something like 16 plus x minus 1 squared, where this is 4 squared plus x minus 1 squared. Okay. So we're getting this idea here. Let me just show a couple examples of this last form. If I have something like um, of this form x squared minus a squared. Well, this is things like x squared minus 1, x squared minus 5, x squared minus 16, maybe even things like 2x squared minus 5, 9x squared minus 16, and then I can have something in parentheses like x plus 5 squared minus 4. So again, it's a variable thing squared minus a constant thing squared in that form. Okay, so that's what we mean by those different forms. So let's look at two examples where we have some of those forms involved and see what's different about how we would handle each of these two situations. So on the left hand side I have an integral of x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so I do have this sort of a squared minus x squared form here, but I don't need to use a new technique on this because if we look at this integral we see that u substitution would work here. So I could just use a standard u substitution in this case where I have u is 1 minus x squared, du is negative 2x dx, so I have negative 1 half du is x dx, and I see I end up here with this negative 1 half an integral of u, root u du. Okay, so we know sort of how to go about doing a u substitution. So there was a variable substitution involved, a u substitution. u was a new variable that we defined in terms of the old variable x. Okay, so I had some kind of u of x. u was a function of x. The new substitution that we're introducing, trig substitution, is another variable substitution. So that's why we're um, reminding ourselves about a u substitution here. So let's look at this other case, this other example that I have here, something like the integral of the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we see that u substitution isn't going to work on this case because I don't have the derivative of the inside being multiplied times it anywhere. So the idea with trig substitution is to introduce a trig function into our problem in order to make use of some of the nice properties that we have with the Pythagorean identities. So let's think about our Pythagorean identities here. I remember one of the identities that we had was that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta was equal to 1. Notice what I have under this particular square root is 1 minus something squared. 
So notice I could rewrite this identity here as 1 minus sine squared theta equals cosine squared theta. So if I let x be sine theta, then I could replace 1 minus x squared with 1 minus sine squared, which would allow me to replace what's under the square root by cosine squared. So the idea of doing this trig substitution is to help us be able to simplify what's under that square root, because we know that the square root of 1 minus x squared is not 1 minus x. We know the square root of a sum is not the square root of the first thing minus the square root of the second thing. But if I could replace this whole difference by a single thing that was a perfect square, I could undo that square root. Okay, So we're going to take the variable x here okay, and define it um, as a function of a new variable. And often our new variable we're going to use is theta, although it doesn't have to be. So we'll let x be equal to sine theta. Okay, so see how this is a little different than what we had before. Before we did a new variable u was a function of our old variable x. Here our old variable x is a function of this new variable theta, and specifically with trig substitution, it's going to be a trig function of that um, new variable. But then just like with u substitution, I had to find a du. Here I got to take the derivative and find dx in terms of theta, so I get dx is cosine theta d theta. So what does this allow me to do? Well now I can take this integral of 1 minus x squared dx and write it as an integral of the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta times dx, where dx is cosine theta d theta. And then I get to use my identity here and say, well, the square root of 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared times cosine theta d theta. Okay. Now, technically, whenever I'm doing the um, square root of something squared, that's equal to the absolute value. So this would be the absolute value of cosine theta times cosine theta d theta. But I know if I'm going to have a product of two cosines, no matter what those signs are, I'm going to end up with just this cosine squared that I'd be integrating. So notice that we took this problem of the integral of the square root of 1 minus x squared and turned it into an integral of a trig function. So we'll see with um, through our different trig sum examples, we're going to introduce trig functions into problems that don't have trig functions to begin with, and that's going to um, have us result in a trig integral. So we'll have to use some of the techniques from, from section 7.2 on handling integrating those um, different kinds of products of trig functions. Okay, So we want to say a little bit more about why maybe I used this identity here versus some other kind of identity for this particular form. We'll also say a little bit about simplifying these, these square roots of something squared. So let's go to the next page in the notes here and look at this key ideas for trig substitution. Okay. So we can think of trig sub as an inverse substitution. Okay, remember u sub, we had u was some sort of function of x. Now we're going to have x is some um, function of theta. So it's a little bit, a little bit backwards from before. Okay. So in our previous example, we had x was equal to sine theta. Okay. Well, that means theta would be equal to arc sine of x. Okay. Also notice, just a notational note, we're not saying anything like x equals sine x, okay? It is x equals sine of a new variable. You don't have to use theta specifically. If you like t or some other letter, that's fine, but it needs to be a different variable than what you started with. So for us to be able to go back and forth between um, x's and theta's and have that be a one-to-one -one correspondence, we need our, our function sine theta here to be one-to-one. -one. If you think back to what kinds of functions have inverses, um, that was when a function was one-to-one -one or when it passed the horizontal line test. So we know that the sine function 
itself, okay, that doesn't pass the horizontal line test. I would hit multiple points if I drew a horizontal line across. So we want to restrict theta to a particular portion of the sine curve and just use that portion here so we can have, um, it should be a little more curvy looking here. Oops. Um, oops, let me draw that part. So we know we've got our sine function like this and we're just going to want a portion here specifically between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So it will be 1 to 1 on that portion. So if you think back to when you defined the, the various inverse trig functions, we're talking about um, using the restricted domain. Okay. And that's just so when I um, have a certain x value here, I want to associate that x value with a unique theta value. Okay, so when I'm going to be changing my limits, I might start with some initial x limits. I need to change those to theta limits. We can't all be picking different values of theta. We know that, you know, sine of multiple angles could be the same x value, but we need to restrict ourselves to the same, um, to one region here. So we'll just have a unique theta value for each x value. So let's look at the connections here between our different forms, the substitution that we want to use, and what the restricted domains for each of those substitutions are. And then for each of these, there's also an associated identity that we're using. Just like with this sine substitution, we used um, 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared. Whoops, okay, looks like I already have this table for you in the, uh, in the notes. So I'll go ahead and fill it in down there. So let's look at this. So we've got the a squared minus x squared form. So in its simplest case, that's the 1 minus x squared types form. And the identity that's useful with that is 1 minus sine squared theta equals cosine squared theta. Okay. If you think about our um, trig identities that we had, we had sine squared plus cosine squared was, whoops, was equal to 1, and we had um, tan squared plus 1 equals secant squared. Okay. Well, I want something that's this form 1 minus something squared is equal to a perfect square. Now, I could have taken this 1 equals sine squared plus cosine squared um, identity and written it as 1 minus cosine squared theta equals sine squared theta, okay? But now let's look at this for a second here. So I have this 1 minus sine squared that I used before, which meant I let, since this is 1 minus variable thing squared, 1 minus this sine thing squared, I let x be sine theta, okay? Where my dx was then going to be cosine theta. If instead I had done 1 minus cosine squared equals sine squared, I would have had x equals cosine, and the only reason that we choose to do x equals sine over x equals cosine is that the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and we'd just rather have our derivative be positive given a choice, just because it simplifies things a little bit. So that's why we choose the 1 minus sine squared version. Okay. Now, we said the form was actually something maybe more like a squared minus x squared. So if I take this identity and multiply each term, by a squared, okay, then this part here becomes like my x squared, okay? So more generally, I have x is equal to a sine theta is the kind of substitution that I want. And when we write this down, we're thinking of theta in that restricted domain between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, okay? Or in picture form, you're thinking about the angles in those first and fourth quadrants. Okay. We won't write down this interval every time, but that's what we'll mean when we're doing the trig substitution with sine. Okay. So let's look at our next form. Okay. So I've got a squared plus x squared. So simplified version of that would be like 1 plus x squared. Okay. So what identity do we know that has 1 plus something squared? Well, we've got the 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. There's no way for me to take my sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 
and write it as one plus something and get a, um, a positive thing, right? To move either one of these things to their side, I have to subtract. I'm either gonna have one minus cosine squared or one minus sine squared. I can't get one plus something squared. So the identity that I wanna use is this one plus tan squared. So I wanna use one plus tan squared theta is secant squared theta, okay? And since it's that tan that's being squared here and the x that was being squared here, I wanna be using tan theta for my substitution in this case. And the restriction that we're thinking about with tan theta is negative pi over two to pi over two, but just not including pi over two and negative pi over two, because um, tangent's not defined at negative pi over two and pi over two. Right. And, excuse me, again, for the more general form here with a squared plus x squared, well, I could multiply through all of this by a squared. Okay, and so I see that more generally I have x is a tan theta, and again, we're thinking about theta between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, so we have this idea that trig subs is um, a useful technique when we have these different forms. And then this next step is telling us, well, which trig function do I want to use for the trig substitution with which of these cases? So in this last case, I have something like x squared minus one. Okay, is that the simple example? So how could I get something minus one? Well, if I took my one equals sine squared plus cosine squared, I could subtract one from both sides, but that would leave either a negative sine squared on, on the left-hand side or a negative cosine squared, and I'm not gonna be replacing something under a square root with a negative um, value, negative cosine squared or negative sine squared. So let's look at this tan squared plus one equals secant squared. I could rewrite that as secant squared theta minus one equals tan squared theta. And now that's the right kind of form that I want. So I see that I have this some kind of thing squared minus one, that thing that's being squared is secant, so I'd wanna do x is secant theta, okay? And the, the restriction that goes with um, this has to do with values in the first and the third quadrants for our restricted domain. And if I multiply through here by a squared, Okay, I see that more generally I have something like x equals a secant theta. And this is using the restricted domain of theta between zero and pi over two, or between um, pi and three pi over two. Okay. Again, you don't have to write down these restrictions each time, but this is what we're, we're thinking or implying whenever we do any of these three um, trig substitutions. Okay, so we'll see how we can go about using these trig substitutions in several examples.